Okay, let us begin. So, uh, there are two versions of the completeness theorem. Yeah, if S is consistent, then S is satisfiable, and if T is a logical consequence of S, then T can be deduced from S. How will you prove version 1 implies version 2? Any ideas? Even if you have not thought about it before, you can think about it now. That's not hard. Like if you use your contrapositive. Contrapositive, okay. So we assume that S, yeah, so let us use contrapositive. So suppose there is no deduction of T from S, then, then, S, is consistent, then, so S, is then S is consistent, yes, <coughs> this is simply the definition of consistency and therefore by version 1. S is satisfiable. Everybody, yeah, I mean, don't write it yet. I will tell you when it is right. And then, why is T a logical consequence of S? No, T should not be a logical consequence. Yes, how will you show that? Which valuation? So, S is satisfiable, there is a valuation V and then which satisfies, which models S. See, on, on our way to this line, we lost touch with T. Okay, anything else? I feel like I spoon feed you on all the answers. Can you use any lemma? Very good, very good. Okay, so we are not using contrapositive of version 2. We can use contrapositive of version 1. Okay, so suppose T is a logical consequence of S, then S union negation T is contradictory or unsatisfiable. Okay, then what? Then by the contrapositive, <coughs> of version 1, S union is inconsistent. And then what? Of yes, then by mm -hmm. there is a proof of double negation T, and then what do we use? LA3, LA3. by LA3, LA3 and monotonicity.
this happens and as a consequence we get this okay so don't lose track of information whatever is given version 2 implies version 1 now You have got all the tools. You just have to line a couple, write a couple of lines. Yeah, that's all. I have done the harder part of proving the completeness theorem. Now you just have to play around. Please tell me. We want to show if S is consistent and S is satisfiable. There aren't too many problems in today's sheet, so I'm going to give you time. Huh. We are just a quanta positive of this statement, like huh. negation v1 implies negation v2. Like of which statement? Okay, negation v1 implies ne so so v1 fails. So this implies that S is satisfiable. Yeah. And this implies that S is not satisfiable, but it is consistent. S is unsatisfiable and it is consistent, okay? Mm. Uh, it is uh, unsatisfiable, there exists again lost Yeah, I mean, uh, in general that is a good thought, but we should not try to contradict something like completeness theorem. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Suppose S is unsatisfiable, then what will happen? For? For any evaluation. Very good. Very good. Yeah, because it is always true. Suppose what is the definition of S models T or uh, T is a logical consequence of S that whenever there is a valuation which makes capital S true then it should make T true but there is nothing which makes capital S true so therefore then clearly or by definition T is a logical consequence of S for all T Okay, and once this happens, then by version 2, T is deducible from capital S for all T. What does that mean? And by definition, S is? Very good. This is clearly, see the length of the proof is very small. Uh, you, you just have to think in the right direction. There isn't much happening here. Okay, good. So, let us go to the next one. So, we want to prove compactness theorem version 1 and version 2 from completeness theorems. So, we have already done one part in the class. Yeah, we have proven version 1 in the class. Now, how would you like to prove version 2? Either you can just use version 1 to prove version 2 or you can use completeness theorem to prove version 2. Um, completeness theorem version 2 will Completeness theorem version 2, okay. So, if uh, S models T, I mean, if S is a logical consequence, I mean, if T is a logical consequence of S, then S models. So, completeness version 2 implies compactness version 2.
ओके इफ टी इज अ लॉजिकल कॉन्सिक्वेंस ऑफ एस देन बाय कंप्लीटनेस वर्जन टू बाय फाइनाइट कैरेक्टर lemma what do we get there that prime. there is a finite s prime deduces t for some finite s prime contained inside s and hence hence by what hence by soundness soundness also has got two versions version 1 and 2 okay hence by soundness we get s prime has t as a logical consequence so done well i will give you two more exercises that show that version 1 and version 2 are equivalent yeah they are both compact called compactness version uh, theorems so they are equivalent and i am not going to spend any time on this right now but you should be aware of those problems okay lemma 5 this is the simplest one has anybody found a solution for this yeah yeah how many lines is it no i skipped some like i combined two steps so i don't know Anybody else who has solved this? Like I used the line and the proof of lemma two, and like I directly started from there. Okay, uh, maybe you want to write it. some of you asked me last saturday that we have got a long weekend why don't you give us the assignment sheet early this week so i worked on that day and i completed the assignment and now only one person has solved this problem I mean, where is the first line coming from? Yeah, so wait, I like more stuff. Because they can do when. Mm hmm. Where have you done this? Have we done it in the class yet? Yeah. This from lemma two. Lemma two. Yeah, okay yeah it's not so good haha uh -huh. from lemma 2 inconsistency of s comma negation s okay finished yeah i should have the yeah write the reasons Does anybody have an alternate proof? Yes. What does it show me? Yes. Very good. I want you to write it down afterwards. There is a three-line proof. <laughs> Please. As you can see, there are multiple proofs, and they all can be valid.
you are not using the symbol of turnstile. Huh. Very good. So, this is a three line proof. Yes. And that is, so usually uh, this is a very useful trick when you are working with Boolean algebras. Yeah, the triple negation is always the same as single negation. Yeah, even if you are working in something like intuitionistic logic, when double negation is not the same as the given statement, still this is valid. So, therefore, triple negation is always a useful thing to remember. Yeah, I mean this is a trick. Okay, good. So, let us go ahead. Lemma 4, let me write down the solution for you, yeah, this is quite complicated, okay, so first line, I mean of course we have to use uh, dt at the end, this term is quite complicated to deal with, yeah, s implies negation s. So, therefore, it is better to keep it on the left hand side than on the right hand side. Right. So, so, first of all, you can conclude double negation S implies S. What is the reason? At least tell me the reasons. LA3, okay. Second, yeah, then uh, we are going to bring S implies negation S and double negation S. We are going to bring both of them over here and this is just DT. Okay, third line we use NLA and MP together. I mean not together, we can write some NLA and then MP. So, which one, if I tell you these two reasons, which NLA should I use? S implies negation S. Implies negation S. Very good. So, this is NLA. Then fourth one, obviously I should use MP and on which two lines? 2 and 3. Okay. Fifth one. Now that we have double ne uh, negation S, now we can uh, use, we have S and we have negation S. Okay. And whenever we have both of them, what should we use? Huh? Lemma 9. Lemma 9. No, lemma 9 is for proving inconsistency. Yeah, that should not be used in any formal proofs. But the proof of lemma 9 use lemma 2. So, let us use lemma 2. And monotonicity. So, S implies negation S implies. And here we have got a chance to introduce whatever we want. Yeah, because S implies negation S implies T, where T is arbitrary. Right? So, this is our chance and we are going to introduce negation S implies S and this is by lemma 2 and monotonicity. Okay. 
Okay, now I'm just going to skip six, uh, step six. Uh, complete it and I am directly going to conclude negation as simple as this. Yeah, it's two times MP and then what? We can use DT. Yeah, we can transfer something to So, I am going to uh, keep S implies negation S on this side and I am going to transfer this part. This is DT. What would be the next step now? LA4. LA4. Very good. So, S implies negation S proves. So, double negation S implies negation S implies S, whole thing implies S implies S implies negation S. Okay, now can you see the final proof? So, line number 10 will tell us that with the same left hand side we can conclude S implies S implies negation S and this is by MP on the above two lines, MP89 and line number 11, we still have to obtain S implies S and how do we get that? Lemma 1. Lemma 1 and monotonicity and then line number 12 we will get negation S by MP 10 11 and finally with nothing on the left hand side we will use DT to obtain this ok not at all straightforward. Yeah, it is e difficult to come up with all these things, but I am sure because we are using something like lemma 2, yeah, we have got lot of ways to do it. Yeah, we introduce something arbitrary over here. Okay, any other, any questions about this? Once you get the solutions, there are no questions, yeah? but to find the solution, you still need to struggle. Okay, lemma 6. So, let me write down the solution for you. What is our ultimate goal here? I mean, as long as we show this, we are done. Yeah, then you just have to use DT twice. Okay, so uh, let us start. So, we, we should use LA3 first. <coughs> what is LA3? Double negation, elimination. Okay, what is the second step? DT. I am using DT twice. Okay. Third step. Lemma 5 with P. What is Lemma 5? P implies double negation T. So, this is Lemma 5 
and monotonicity. Okay, fourth step. Now you know what it is. Double negation T and that's MP uh, on two. Okay. Then let us transfer this double negation to that side and now you can see the proof. Yes, how do we eliminate one negation from this? Okay, good. <coughs> okay, then seventh. Uh, this is just MP on the previous two lines and then you simply have to use DT. I mean this goal was not really necessary in that regard. And maybe I can get rid of this. Okay. So you have to learn to play around with axioms and that's the only way to do it. Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to do question 7 on the board. I hope you have all read it because it's a long question. Um, but it talks about something called graphs. How many of you have seen graphs before? Not the x-axis, y-axis graphs, but the vertices and edges graphs one okay not a lot of people uh, so I'll talk about what a graph is first so the formal definition has been given in the question um, the formal definition of a simple undirected graph so um, it's given by a pair uh, of a pair uh, which consists of one so the question tells you that a graph is a pair V comma E where this is a set of vertices and this is a set of edges, which is a subset of V cross V. But um, that kind of notation is not very easy for human beings to work with. Maybe a computer would like it. Uh, so what we generally work with is the drawing of a graph. So what you have is a set of vertices, um, which you denote using points, and you can label them if you want. And then you have a set of edges. Now you've been given some nice properties about the set of edges that it is irreflexive and it is symmetric. Um, so um, yeah, and it's going to be a subset of V cross V. So what you do is that whenever you have an edge in E that looks like 1 comma 2, suppose 1 comma 2 is in E, then you just draw a line between them. Because you also know that 2 comma 1 will be in E because of symmetry. Uh, so you can do nice things like this. Uh, if 2 comma 3 is not an E, then you don't draw this line. Um, if 1 comma 3 is an E, then you draw this line and so on. So this graph is going, uh, this drawing is going to denote the graph 1, 2, 3, 4 and the set of edges will be 1, 2, 2, 1, uh, 1, 3, 3, 1 um, and 3, 4, 4, 3. Maybe I'll add one more edge. 2, 3, 3, 2. Uh, so things like that. I any questions about this? So this is a very small example. Uh, the question actually asks you to prove something that is also true for infinite graphs, which you can't really draw. Um, okay, now um, also the question deals with the coloring of a graph. So, 
again the formal definition is giving, given there but what does a coloring really mean? You have uh, a set of k colors so maybe I'll take I'll take two colors so my k equals two here and what you do is you assign a color to each vertex such that uh, if two vertices are connected by an edge they don't get the same color so say I color this yellow that means I can't color one and three yellow because they're connected by an edge so maybe I can color them blue and I can't color four blue because it's connected to three which is already blue so I'm forced to color this yellow and now this is a valid two coloring of this of this graph blue yellow coloring uh, of course you can't always color a graph nicely for example if I give you um, this graph um, can I color it with two colors let's try so the first color you can just assign randomly right it doesn't matter uh, that forces these two colors to be different from yellow so if I color this one blue I can color this neither yellow nor blue because it's connected to both of them so I can't color it with two colors um, can I color it with three colors no again no because if I give this the color red then I won't be able to color this anything um, so right so um, in fact you have something called the chromatic number of a graph which is the minimum number the minimum natural number k such that you can color the graph with k colors yeah no. one and three are colored the same in the first example I'm so sorry uh, that's very silly um, yeah I messed up here uh, this graph is not two colorable you would need three colors yeah I'm very sorry about that uh, I didn't <coughs> see that last edge okay so now you have two choices for this uh, vertex 4 either you can color it red or I mean uh, blue or yellow yeah so this graph is also not two colorable but it is three colorable this graph is four colorable um, uh, and um, Oh, also the question mentions subgraphs so what is a subgraph um, well you have this graph and you get a subgraph by removing some vertices and edges but of course uh, if you remove for example uh, if from this graph I removed vertex 2 uh, but left these two edges it would make no sense because the resulting thing would not be a graph right because a, the set of edges has to be a subset of v cross v in if I remove this vertex then uh, 2 isn't in my vertex set and so you can't be having these edges anymore so what is a subgraph a subgraph g dash of g will be a set v dash comma e dash where v dash is a subset of v and e dash uh, is going to be a subset of e such that you are only taking edges of which the vertices have survived so um, e dash is also a subset of v dash cross v dash so then this would be a valid graph right so in this case if I wanted to remove this vertex 2 then I would also have to remove the associated edges uh, and maybe I could also remove this edge if I wanted then I would be left with three vertices and one edge so this is a valid graph any questions about what a graph is what a subgraph is uh, you will probably be encountering graphs a lot in your stay at IIT and later so this was a short introduction now we can um, dive into the question so the question asks you to show that um, a graph is k colorable if and only if every finite subgraph is k colorable and you have to show this using compactness so is one side of this obvious If a graph is k-colorable, every finite sub, uh, subgraph is k-colorable. Um, what happened? Okay, 
what happened here. Uh, I removed some vertices and edges with uh, the coloring, the, the subgraph and the coloring that was left. Is this a valid three coloring of this graph? Right? Um, do you think this would hold in general that if I take a graph and I take a subgraph of it, if the original graph was k-colorable, should the subgraph also remain k-colorable? Yeah? Right? Okay. So that means that one side is obvious. If a graph is k-colorable, then every finite subgraph must be k-colorable. In fact, every uh, subgraph will be k-colorable, even if you remove the finiteness condition. So any questions? Fine. Um, so I haven't done that part. You can write that part on your own. Um, I am more interested in showing you how to do the other side, which is that if every finite subgraph is k-colorable, then the graph is k-colorable. And you have to use compactness, which means that you would need to define the language and the set of formulas that uh, you will show finite satisfiability of and proceed. So the question also gives you a hint. Um, you start with defining a set of propositional variables. We'll call that set L. This consists of P, X, I, where X is iterates over the vertices and I iterates over the colors. Um, now, um, yeah, I haven't written the meanings of this because most of them are in the question, but um, what P, X, I intuitively should denote to you uh, is um, when you define a valuation in P, X, I, if it's true, that means that you're assigning the color i to the vertex x. Uh, and if it's false, then you're not assigning that color. Uh, so that, that's uh, the meaning of that pxi that you should keep at the back of your mind. Um, and then you define a formula for each vertex. Uh, you define sx, which says what? You want sx to denote the fact um, that uh, the vertex x re receives exactly one color, right? So for k-colorability, that is one condition, that each vertex receives exactly one color because it's a function. It's given to be a function. Um, therefore, each uh, element of the domain needs to re receive exactly one element of the range. Um, so this is what that formula denotes. Um, what it says is that um, it has, it's the join of all the pxis. Uh, so what, where i uh, iterates over the colors while x is fixed, right? So this tells you um, if you want the formula to be satisfied, you would want at least one pxi to be true, which means that your um, vertex receive your vertex x receives at least one color, right? Is anybody lost? Okay. Uh, but, uh, so that, that's the first part that's done. The second part should tell you that a vertex doesn't receive more than one color, which is exactly what the second thing is doing, that um, for each i less than j, so i and j are colors, it does not happen that both pxi and both pxj are true. So the vertex doesn't receive both the color i and the color j, where x is not equal to j necessarily. Uh, right. So Sx intuitively should denote the formula that each vertex gets exactly one color. Any questions? Okay. Uh, now what is the second thing that you need for a coloring? The second. So the neighboring vertex is true. Exactly. So then for each uh, edge, you have to, you would like to define a formula that captures that notion. Uh, so for that, you define TXY. So TXY says that um, PXI happens if and only if PYI um, doesn't happen. And you define this for all, I mean, I haven't even said what, it, what's, what it's defined for, uh, but we'll come to that later. Um, intuitively, uh, what you should think of this is that if X and Y are endpoints of an edge, then for each color, X receives a color if and only if Y doesn't receive a color or vice versa, right? Um, no, how is it if and only if? It should be only if. It would not matter because, you, I mean, you would have TXY and you would also have TYX. Uh, so even if you wrote this and included 
all of these formulas it would be fine because you're given that the graph is symmetric so this would work but this is more intuitive to me so that's why I'm writing um, it like this okay um, so now you'd want to define your set of formulas which captures that your graph is k colorable right um, so that's the idea that you have in mind when you're defining the set of formulas so first thing you need uh, is for every vertex to have a color so for each vertex you include the formula sx and then for each edge for each edge x comma y you include the formula txy and also i mean because e is symmetric e yx is also going to be here so tyx is also going to be here so as Sri Ram said you don't really need both sides you can only you can have one and it would be fine um, any questions still here what is this set s uh, does everybody understand why we have defined s like this okay now um, we've shown one side of the argument we have to show the other side we have to show that um, given that every finite subgraph of g is k colorable you want to show that g is also k colorable so let's take that hypothesis suppose every finite subgraph of g is k colorable now um, does this automatically give you that s is finitely satisfiable <coughs> how many people say yes and how many people say no? no? Why do you say no? Because like, any collection of those statements won't necessarily like, describe a subgraph. Exactly. So maybe you have this subgraph. Um, uh, or sorry, maybe you have um, your T corresponding to this graph. I'm defining something. So maybe you have um, or not got okay suppose our graph is this and then we also have these other things so suppose that my um, subset finite subset of s contains the formulas s1 s3 p1 2 but this doesn't really correspond to any subgraph of this right because it doesn't have the vertex 2 in it For this to define a subgraph, you would need, um, if you want to draw a graph corresponding to this, you would have 1, you would have 3, and then suddenly you would want that edge that connects 1 and 2, but vertex 2 just does not exist, so what are you going to do about it? Uh, so you can't directly use compactness, you have to do a little bit of work. Um, okay, suppose that S0 is a finite subset of S. Uh, so you have a finite subset of formulas and let V0 be the set of vertices that are either in S0 uh, such that Sx is in S0 or such that um, some formula Txy is in S0. Why don't I need to include Tyx here? It's symmetric. Um, okay. Now I want to define a set of a larger set of formulas such that um, my set of formulas will actually describe a subgraph, a valid subgraph. So you define S1, which has all Sx where x is a vertex in V0. And it also has all the edges that are in E such that both vertices uh, lie in V0. Is this a valid subgraph? I've just enlarged it. So if I wanted to... Uh, perform this operation on this set then my this if this was my s naught then my s1 would look something like s1 s3 i would also add s2 because this 2 is over here and then i would have t12 would i have something else also <coughs> i mean okay it'll become a bit larger maybe I would also have T13, I don't need to include um, T13, but okay, the way I've defined it, it would, but things will work fine, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so now you define your subgraph to be exactly the one described by this, your set of vertices 
uh, and your set of edges being the ones that are here. And since V0 is finite, since your vertex set is finite, uh, and your edge set is a subset of V cross V0 cross V0, uh, your entire graph is going to be finite. So this is a finite subgraph of G. Um, by the, our hypothesis, it is K colorable. So what does that mean? There's a K coloring. So there's a function from the set of vertices to the set of K colors. Um, and now, how from here do we say that our S1 is satisfiable? We want to define a valuation on the propositional variables. Um, we define a valuation that gives um, each, we now use the intuition that we had at the back of our mind. We say that Pxi uh, is true if and only if we have assigned our vertex V a color I. Does that make sense? And um, then you can check, you should check this, that S1 will status, um, sorry, the value, I, I wrote it the other way, I should write that the valuation V satisfies um, S, S1. Um, right? Um, okay, we can check that it satisfies the formulas. Uh, that means that S1 is satisfiable. Uh, and since S0 is a subset of S1, S0 will also be satisfiable. Um, and since S0 was an arbitrary finite subset of um, your formulas, uh, you can conclude by compactness that S is going to be satisfiable. Any questions? Any confusions? This is not the end because you have to still say that your graph G is K colorable, but I have left that to you. Uh, why does this valuation correspond to a K coloring of G? You still have to define this K coloring on the, you need to define um, chi dash on from V to K, uh, which is a valid coloring. And therefore, you can conclude that your graph G is K colorable. Any questions? We cannot yeah. use uh, that directly because that is not a valid subgraph. Yeah, yeah, because you want to use that every finite subgraph is K colorable, but if your set of formulas doesn't correspond to a graph, then uh, you can't use it. Yeah. Yeah. Every subset of S, uh, this S1, you defined a graph using S1 and you said that since S1 corresponds to this graph and this graph is a finite subset of G, it is K colorable and therefore S1 is satisfiable and therefore the smaller subset is satisfiable. This was a lot of stuff because I also defined graphs for you, so any questions here? Okay, then we are done.